is pretty similar to what you've seen in Java and C and C++, and all of you have had some experience with at least one of those languages. But some of the things that look the same are actually quite different, and there are lots of things that are actually quite new and unusual that you will see in Rust. The first thing I want to look at is the difference between if in Rust and if in Java or C or C++. The grammar is pretty similar. What's the big difference between if in Rust and if in Java? Good, yeah, so what does that mean? What's the, what does it mean for if to be an expression in Rust and if to be a statement in Java, and why should we care? Okay, good, right, so the difference is statements don't have values, expressions do have values. Um, which is better? Do we want if to be a statement or an expression? So, are there, there, so if, if was a statement in Rust instead of expression, is there anything you could do that you can't do with if being an expression? Should every language have if expressions instead of if statements? So the Java designers were just stupid. I certainly would much prefer the languages I use to have if expressions instead of if statements. Um, there are some reasons you might want if statements. Certainly, they, they don't allow you to express things that you couldn't express with if expressions, because you can always just ignore the value. They do confine things, right? So if you want to limit the things programmers can do, and a lot of the Rust philosophy is to limit the things programmers can do, well, then there, there might be reasons why you would want to limit that. And certainly, you can abuse the richness of having everything be an expression and end up writing programs that are much harder to understand. There are lots and lots of places where it's, it's very nice to, nice to have if be an expression. But here's an example of some sort of Rust code. It's not correct. What do we think we get when we try to compile and run this code? And I do have four stickers to give away today. So I'm trying to ration my stickers because I don't have too many left. But if I get a good answer for this, I will give out a sticker. Uh, no, so Rust does not care at all about white space. We can have as many new lines or as few new lines as we want, uh, as many spaces or as few as we want. Yeah, at the back? A type error. OK, good. Why a type error? Sorry, so which expression? Yeah, I think you've got the right answer stated a little more clearly. The type that that expression evaluates to is not a Boolean. And the rule for if is it has to be a Boolean. So what actually is the type of that syntactically valid expression? So it's the type of no value. And the, and the way the error message will look is with parens like this. And you'll notice that this is not a wonderful error message. Using that as the type name is sort of annoying. The other thing that I think is really annoying is it repeats this twice. Sometimes it gives you some useful additional information. And what it produces is the, the second explanation. Here it's just annoying you. So one thing I do want to encourage you all to do um, that you should have seen on the course site a link to a page for submitting any error messages you get from the Rust compiler that you don't like. Kiet Tran, who was a student last semester who did the work on the dead code elimination, that's part of the, the Rust compiler now, is working on a project to try to improve the error messages that the Rust compiler generates. So part of that is understanding what's wrong with the ones it's generating now. So if you see messages like this, you should report them. Here's another example. We've fixed that problem. Well, what does the compiler produce for this? Not quite a type error, or it could be, a, it's a kind of type error. So, and that was actually the only choice here, right? So the problem now is that we've got an assignment and x was not mutable. It will report that a little differently than a, than a type error. It reports that as a, an assignment to an immutable variable, and variable is really a bad name for what x is, because you can't vary it. So we need the mute here. Now, how do we like this? I, well, we don't like this. This is really horrible code. But does it compile and run correctly? Yeah. So now we've got our if predicate does evaluate to a Boolean. And both of the branches evaluate to integers, which is what's required. And our function returns an integer, which is what these expressions evaluate to. So this is OK. Not the kind of code I would recommend writing. It's correct. One more little subtle change to see if people are awake. What do we expect to get from this? The brackets after, oh, so it's not required to have brackets around the if expression. 
right? As long as this is something that, that parses an expression, uh, that's OK. Um, now, yeah, this, the grammar I have, have here, you're correct, that according to this grammar, it would be a syntax error. This grammar is not complete. That's a good point reading this grammar, but a block doesn't actually need the squiggles around it. And it's good. So what kind of error do we think we're going to get? Because so, so the problem is we've got this extra semicolon here. Right? And a semicolon turns an expression into a statement. What kind of error is that going to lead to? So it's a type error because it's actually going to be noticed before checking the return type because the two branches of an if expression should have the same type. We get a mismatch because it expected an int because there was an int here and the type is actually none. The other thing I want to talk about in Rust today is higher order functions. And this is something that you've probably had less experience with so far than I would hope you have. But you'll get a fair bit of experience with it this semester. If you haven't had any experience with it, um, you know, it's not something we're going to cover uh, at, as an introduction or in, in a lot of depth in this class. But it's definitely something that there are lots of resources on, and I'll have some links to some. So what a higher order function means is a function that can be used with other functions. So we can have functions as parameters to functions. We can also have functions that return functions. And lots of the things that we want to do in Rust, the best way to do them is by passing functions. Part of the reason you haven't had a lot of experience with this is Java didn't really have any good mechanisms for doing this until the version that's supposed to come out this year. Given that you've taken a lot of classes that have mo mostly used Java, you haven't really had an opportunity to take advantage of higher order functions. Most languages do have ways to make functions and to use functions as first class values. So in scheme, what you have is a lambda expression. And this just means make a procedure that has this parameter and does this in the body. And in Rust, we have something very similar. We can either use the bars like this, which is basically make a procedure, and these are the parameters, and this would be the body. The proc. So this has changed between Rust 0.8 and 0.9. So a lot of the documentation you may run into um, is, is incorrect. And it's one of the areas of the Rust compiler that is a little flaky still. The places where you'll use it, um, it will be important to use it and think about ways to, to use functions. Get a little practice with this. I want you to think about how you would define a function that takes one integer as input. And it's going to return a function that will also take an integer and give you the sum. So if we call make adder the first time, like this, we're passing in 1. We're going to get a function as a result that when we apply that function to some number, we'll add 1. And so when we call increment with 3, we should get 4 as the result. OK, good. Yeah, so the first thing we should think about any time we're programming a function is usually what the types are. The parameter type is pretty simple. The return type is going to be a lot more complicated. So what's the return type? of our adder function. Yeah, our return type's a function. And we can write that lots of different ways using fn. So that is a function that takes an integer and returns an integer. We don't necessarily need parens around it, but it's going to make it a lot easier to read like that. Our return type's a function. So now what's the body of make adder? We're going to make a function. It's going to have a parameter. And it's going to have a body. And the body, in this case, well, a came from here. This is a the first parameter. So we just want to add a plus b as a result. Now we've got a function that can return functions that will add some value that we selected when we made the adder to our result. And here's how that looks written out. So you're searching if we put a semicolon here. OK, good. So does anyone? want to answer that, how would that change things? Well, it would actually give us a type error, right? Because the type of this function, it's supposed to return a function. If we had the semicolon there, it's going to return the none type, and that's going to be a type error. So that would be a problem. What if we put the semicolon here? What do you think would happen? Now we're still returning a function, at least. Yeah. So now we'd get a type error because the function we're returning doesn't return an it. Now, there's one big limitation of this that because of the ownership rules, we can only actually use our function once. If we tried to use increment again, we would get a, a compiler error. So that's kind of a, a pretty serious, annoying limitation of 
this way of doing things in Rust, but there's no simple way in the current version of Rust to make a function that you can use more than once. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more practice with this. So we'll try something a little trickier. The question now is to define a function n times that will take as input a function to build a function that will apply that n times. So if we do n times double two, we should get a function that will do double twice, and then if we apply that function to two, we're gonna do double two and double of that. And we're gonna, in the body of that procedure, right, so we're turning a procedure that takes an int, returns an int, and its body is gonna be calling n times, reducing the number of times by one, as well as calling the function that was passed in. What do you think we're gonna get when we run this program? You can get all three stickers I have left today if you get this right. Well, you're probably not gonna guess. What we get is actually a segmentation fault. So we've run into a bug in the Rust compiler runtime. This should certainly worry you a little bit, right? This is not a super complicated program. It, it is using things that might not get used that often and that are in flux in the, in the Rust design. What does a segmentation fault mean? You've probably seen these sum in 2150. Yeah, yeah. So you had a, an attempt by your program to access some memory that's not part of your program to memory space. Right, so we talked about part of the process abstraction is isolating programs. So they can't access all of the memory of the physical machine. What happened here is the program attempted to access some memory address that's not part of its memory space. That should never happen in a Rust program. Right? If that happens in a C program or a C++ program or assembly code that you're writing, that's probably your fault as a programmer. If that happens in a Rust program where you didn't use unsafe, that means you've run into a bug in the compiler. At least the good news is you know it's not your fault, unlike if it was C or C++ code. This should worry us a little bit, right? So you're using a compiler in this class that has pretty serious bugs that occur on fairly simple programs. If you went to Grade and Horse page as, as the creator of Rust, it you know, sort of warns you about that. I don't know what happens when a compiler eats your laundry, but it can't be good. There are certainly drawbacks to using a new language. This is from before last semester's class. Some people think it might be a bad idea to do that in a course, but they don't know how right and forgiving and kind UVA students are, so it's okay. But there are certainly lots of drawbacks to using a new language like this. It's certainly immature. Many of you have run into this you know, lack of documentation problem. There's, there's, you're laughing now, it's, it's much, much better than it was last semester. Partly because some of the students last semester are helping produce better documentation for you, um, but lots of other people are as well. It's not used much yet, so one of the nice things about using C or, or learning to program C well, you can easily contribute to lots of open source projects that are using it, um, including Linux. There's getting to be a handful of projects that are using Rust, but um, certainly no long established ones because it hasn't been around for that long. On the other hand, there are lots of advantages to using a new language. The one that I think is, is probably most important is you know, it really does benefit from all the things that the research community and the industry community have learned about how to program and how to build compilers in the last 30 years, whereas C was designed back in the early 70s and still suffers from being backwards compatible with that design. As a new language, things are changing fast. So the example code that I wrote for last semester doesn't work anymore, which can be kind of annoying, but is also sort of a, a good thing about it that any issues that are not ideal should be considered, at least people will consider improving them, you have a lot more opportunity to actually influence the language and see things get better. But there are also things that will really, I think, help you develop as a programmer and think about the way you write programs differently, as well as enable you to create programs that work much better than if you were writing your programs in C. And we'll get into some of those specific things in later classes. I'm not gonna to get into them more today. Uh, you've certainly seen some of them in, in problem set one already. But this lack of documentation is a pretty serious issue. What do we do about that? If you were you know, a CS101 or 1110 programmer as you know, a baby programmer, you should fairly expect you know, anything that you're asked to do in an assignment is gonna use things that you've already seen. Everything that you're expected to use in a, in a problem set in those classes is just putting together things that you've already seen probably at least a couple times in class, as well as in a book, as well as in notes, as well as in the problem set. Right? You're not expected to, to figure out anything new, and if you encounter a problem that you couldn't solve with those things, 
you should probably give up in disgust and go complain to the, the TAs or the professor or someone else. But you're no longer baby programmer. CS 2150 hopefully sort of was the transition from being a baby programmer to being more of a professional amateur programmer. And now you know, you, that you're in this class, you really should be thinking of yourself much more of a professional amateur programmer. I don't want you to ever give, give up on the amateur. Amateur means you do things because you like to. Professional means you do things because you're getting paid. Right. So hopefully you will, you will keep both of these throughout your career as a programmer. As a professional amateur, well, you should be able to solve these problems on your own. A lot of what programmers end up having to do in the real world is deal with poorly documented, not quite correctly functioning tools. There's a lot of benefit to sort of having that experience and learning how to deal with that and figuring out how to make the most of it. So there are lots of things that you can do to solve these problems. Certainly looking at the official documentation is useful. I'll, I'll have some links in the notes that I hope will help you find the things you want. But there are lots of other places to look. There are also other things to look at. The, the one thing I actually should add, you can also look at the source code of the, the Rust libraries and the Rust compiler, especially for the libraries. That's the ultimate way to figure out what's going on. And there's actually, as part of the library code, there's also test code. So you might not need to look at the source code, how it's implemented, but you'll find lots of examples in the test code. So one of the things you should definitely be getting more comfortable at is reading source code like that and figuring out things from it. The other part of that is when you do figure something out, you spend a lot of time and effort on doing that, you should help other people as a result. So instead of whining about these things, when you encounter things that are poorly documented or don't behave like you expect, you should view that as, as a really good opportunity. chance for you to be the first one to write some good document that explains those things. And if you write it, you know, it's much easier to be the one who writes the best tutorial on strings in Rust than to be the one who writes the best tutorial on strings in C or C++ that thousands of people have already tried to explain. Students from last year's our last semester's class have, have done, done that, so they had even less documentation and more buggy compiler than you do, and they still, I think all of them survived. There's a couple I haven't seen since then, so maybe not all survived, but I think they all survived. And, and some are actually doing a lot to make the documentation that you have, have better, as well as make the compiler work better. So hopefully some of you will do that as well.